Let's thank our amazing speakers again from the first half. Um, you may have already heard this, but I have been informed by uh, building security that the building has been verified to be good after the earthquake. <laughs> uh, you can use the escalators, elevators, etc. If there are any subsequent earthquakes, the advice is to shelter here in place uh, and wait for further instruction. All right, that was something, not something I had, <laughs> I had planned for. <laughs> Um, we have two more talks for you, and then we will do a speed solver panel, which will happen here. Um, the first, oh, and then we are going to the Empire Hotel afterwards, which is a nine minute walk from here. We're meeting on the rooftop and hanging out. You're all welcome. Um, but for now, Ben Tausig is an associate professor of music at SUNY Stony Brook. He is the founder and an editor of AV Classic Crosswords, which launched in 2008 as an in-house crossword of The Onion and has been independent since 2012. Ben helped me make one of my first ever crosswords, uh, and I'm delighted that you get to hear from him today. Thank you so much, Brooke, and thank you to Brooke uh, and, and Posmo uh, for inviting me to be part of this and to speak here, it's truly uh, an honor. Uh, I did spend a few minutes during the break trying to come up with a good earthquake joke, but uh, I really didn't have enough time, so it's not my fault. <laughs> that's, that's the best I've got. And it was good to get a joke in there because my talk isn't very funny. <laughs> the word independent is one of the most complex in the English language. It is as idealized as it is difficult to define. Since the mid-1980s, the word independent has been transformed into yet another complex form, the adjective indie. Likely the earliest as well as the most common uses of the word indie were in the terms indie film and indie rock, as you can see here, which respectively reshaped Hollywood and popular music particularly from the 1990s forward. This is a, a Google engram for those who are not familiar with this tool, uh, which shows, in this case, that instances of the word indie followed by uh, these, these possibilities kind of trickled uh, in, in the mid-80s, uh, shot up in the 90s, and then you know, by, by the 2000s was a, a pretty common uh, household term to describe different pursuits that uh, had this quality that was called indie, whatever that meant. Uh, the term indie carried a great deal of cachet for creative people, but it was also a serious ethical intervention in creative economies, which often felt dominated by corporate interests. Indie was not supposed to be a style, exactly, although sometimes it felt that way, but instead a mode of resistance against forces of commodification that saw art as a subcontractor of capitalist industries. The idea behind indie pursuits was to reassert art as something with value outside of the marketplace and to reclaim creative spaces from profit-seeking. And I do want to quickly shout out uh, Malaika's talk and Rachel's talk for, I think, epitomizing uh, that effort. Uh, my presentation this afternoon has very little to do with the writing or editing of crosswords. Rather, I want to talk about the economics of puzzles and specifically the history and the future of what has often been called indie crosswords. When I began constructing and selling puzzles around 2004, I was intensely excited about the possibility of indie crosswords for the reasons described a moment ago. Indie crosswords had been around in some guise for at least a couple of decades, and in fact, I was inspired directly by the playful work done at Games Magazine in the late 1980s in particular. I'm not sure Games ever would have called itself indie, but it had an undeniably independent spirit it was ambitious, inventive, rule-breaking, and often modern in its sensibilities. And although it was owned by a series of larger companies, including at one point Playboy magazine, it never had a consistent parent company and always seemed to be fighting an existential fight. At one point, it went briefly out of print until it found a new buyer. In some ways, the indie spirit that games first brought to Crosswords was institutionalized when Will Shorts became the Times crossword editor in 1993. 
By the time I began writing puzzles 10 years later, the media and pop culture landscapes had changed dramatically, and the possibility of a new kind of indie crossword was coming into view. Matt Gaffney, who incidentally helped me with this talk, Matt Jones and Brendan Emmett Quigley were active in making puzzles for the print editions of alternative weekly newspapers, as well as increasingly for blogs. These new outlets for puzzles also incubated new sensibilities, which were quite male and skewed libertarian dirtbag in their aesthetics. <laughs> I guess that was a laugh line. It's true. <laughs> Tattoos, beer, recreational drugs, and indeed indie rock became popular thematic fodder. This was the crossword environment I walked into in the early 2000s, and it grounded both Inkwell the alternative weekly puzzle that I wrote from 2004 to 2014 for venues like the Village Voice and the Chicago Reader, and later the Onion AV Club, which began in 2006, with constructors including the aforementioned Matt Gaffney, Brendan Emmett Quigley, Francis Heaney, Deb Amlin, Tyler Hinman, who is here, among others. This moment in indie puzzles shared some similarities with what Games Magazine had done in the late 80s. It was ambitious in its ideas and defined itself in opposition to mainstream puzzles. But whereas games was something of a counterpoint to Gene Maleska's famously stodgy and elitist approach, for 2000s indie puzzle makers, it was now the Will Shorts edited Times, ironically a product of games' golden era, from which we sought to differentiate ourselves. The Times' breakfast text, which frowned on enemas and labia and edibles, gave us room to run. Sex and drugs were fair game for the venues these puzzles ran in, weekly newspapers in urban areas, increasingly online, so the choice to bring them into the crossword was logical and not too controversial for solvers. But indie sensibilities were, once again, not just a question of content. The indie puzzles of the 2000s also opened a space for constructors to earn more money for their work and to keep better rights as well. There was no complex structure to the way The Onion paid us, they sent a check each week, and we sent them a puzzle in return. The money could be distributed however we wanted, and the constructors retained all the rights to their puzzles. When the Onion AV Club ended its print edition in 2012, here is uh, their last edition, which I guess was actually 2013, and the crossword feature was dropped and then rebranded by us as the AVCX, now fully independent, we adopted a profit-sharing system through which constructors, constructor pay derived directly from revenue in a given quarter. Constructors continued to keep full rights to reprint their puzzles. There was a strong ethical imperative to this structure, which contrasted with the generally opaque ways that mainstream newspapers bought all rights to a puzzle forever, and continue to do so, in fact, and often paid a pittance regardless. No one understood how much a newspaper was earning or benefiting from its crossword, but it seemed fair to suspect that their profit was orders of magnitude more than the $75 or $150 that the paper was paying the constructor as a one-time only fee for service. This was the predominant puzzle economy against which we took up our fight. But lest this all seem self-aggrandizing, it is also worth examining some of the failures and pitfalls of the 2000s indie moment. In that decade, there was a marked absence of non-male constructors making indie puzzles, let alone running indie puzzle outlets. The explanation that non-male constructors tend to give about why this is the case has to do with the substantial risks that came with starting an indie puzzle at that time. It was far more common for men to be unencumbered with family or caretaking obligations than it was for anyone else. Moreover, the environment of indie puzzles in the 2000s was highly entrepreneurial, probably not too different in certain ways from the risk-taking milieu of Silicon Valley at the same time. Even for those of us who had high ethical ambitions, the project of launching a new business and guiding it to success was most hospitable to men. This condition led to a puzzle landscape that often skewed just as male-dominated as the mainstream puzzle outlets that were supposedly our foil. It also had significant implications for whose art could be supported. If the indie puzzle economy of the 2000s skewed utopian, it was often a squarely male utopia. The indie puzzle landscape changed once again in the 2010s. The internet had by this point begun to displace many of the local print outlets that had sustained indie crosswords in the 2000s, as happened with The Onion. 
By the middle of the decade, sites like Kickstarter and venues like Boggs had become standard ways to fund and operate puzzle enterprises. This brought immediate accessibility benefits and increased gender parity as the male-dominated environment of entrepreneurialism receded. That parity was a major victory. But Verizon, Comcast, and other ISPs, of course, did not pay a single penny to constructors who self-published their work on blogs even though those providers had in certain ways replaced the newspapers where the same puzzles would have previously run. ISPs benefited from people's time and attention, just as newspapers had done before. But it was now expected that constructors would either work for free or else open the tip jar to their solvers. The indie crossword environment was in essence demonetized in the 2010s. Blog puzzles became something like a feeder for the relatively few puzzle outlets that paid money, indie and non. There was a strong buyer's market with an increasingly large and diverse community of constructors generating far more work than there were venues to buy even a fraction of it. Something new then was perhaps first signaled in the last quarter of 2018, which combined some longstanding indie concerns. That was the crowdfunded launch of a new puzzle service called Incubator, a creation originally of Laura Brownstein and Tracy Bennett, which later involved a number of other wonderful constructors, including Brooke Husick. Incubator ran for about five years, aiming for both creator-focused financials and gender equity. Incubator published 100% puzzles by non-binary and women constructors and paid quite well relative to its size and income. In retrospect, the feature was not only a good opportunity in its own right, but it also launched quite a few careers in puzzle making. We might look at Incubator as a signal of an approach to building indie platforms that is continuing to gain traction now. In recent years, there have been a number of outlets that have launched with fanfare, as well as significant capital, only to fall spectacularly flat. This is true not only in puzzles, but for journalism, to which crosswords have long been closely linked. Take for instance BuzzFeed, which started a crossword in 2013 in this fashion. On the journalistic side, take Vice Media. BuzzFeed and Vice both had indie sensibilities and even roots in the 2000s indie context described earlier in this presentation. But both were also quite eager for the stability and growth that could come from corporate ownership and wheelbarrows full of venture capital money. From 2008 onward, BuzzFeed was wholly reliant on venture capital money, while Vice sold a substantial stake to Rupert Murdoch's 21st Century Fox in 2013. When it launched, BuzzFeed's crossword felt like a major step forward for Puzzledom with serious money and a, and a wide platform. But BuzzFeed's vaunted crossword ultimately lasted less than a year once the company realized that difficult themed crosswords drew far fewer eyes than listicles. The feature was axed outright. Vice Media, meanwhile, filed for bankruptcy in 2023 and was sold and effectively shuttered in 2024. For crossword constructors and journalists alike, it has turned out that corporate platforms in an era of brutal consolidations and buy-offs, no matter how much they might bear a superficial sheen of indiness, are profoundly risky. Without a doubt, in 2024, we are deep in a moment where platforms old and new, which depend on investment capital, are highly precarious which in turn makes platforms for creative expression precarious as well. The current moment in indie puzzling must be understood in reference to this state of affairs, and it calls for, th for thoughtful protections. Incubator and the AVCX, for the most part, have built platforms without venture capital's involvement, allowing for equitable pay, expressly equitable hiring in the case of Incubator, and at least a modicum of long-term stability. There is no mandate for profitability or growth for these platforms. It is enough to simply pay creators a good and transparent rate. What we sacrifice in turbocharged growth, we make up for in knowing that we can continue from day to day, from year to year. Incubator was even able to close on its own terms at the end of 2023, not for financial reasons or because of outside maneuvering, but because the staff felt that they had achieved what they wanted. Journalism has recently turned to similar models. Defector Media, which has an ABCX branded crossword, is a worker-owned venture that formed after the venture capital-led restructuring of Deadspin. Flaming Hydra is a new site with a similar system. The leftist media outlet Africa is a Country continues to operate without corporate backing, and there are many others. 
One hopes that no one has illusions about Patreon-funded media outlets being perfect, nor a cure-all for all the woes of the economy of contemporary media, including crosswords. Nevertheless, I would argue that a genuine dedication to indie structures, not just in sensibility, but in relation to the risks of corporate consolidation, is as important now as ever. There are new angles to consider, new maneuvers we must make to navigate the challenges of the present, but it is crucial to the long-term sustainability of any crossword outlet that it remain as unencumbered as possible by the existential risks of profit quotas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions for Ben? Um, yes, so this, this isn't directly related to, uh, to, the, um, to uh, the idea of indie puzzles. It's more just, I just have to say while you're up there, your gender fluid puzzle is one of the best oh. things I have ever seen. I just had Thanks. to say that. It's incredible. Thank, thank you. you so much for doing that. Cheers. Thank you. Other questions for Ben? Malai. Hey, Ben. Um, ben, by the way, published my first ever puzzle, so thank you. Um, I'm curious if a non-indie outlet ever reached out to you and asked you to consult or work for them, if that would be something you'd be open to. Yeah, it's happened many times, and I've done it. Um, and sometimes it's, I just sort of do it just because. Um, like I, I don't, I mean, I have no sort of purist ambitions. Um, I'm a lot more sensitive to tethering the ABCX to particular relationships, like particular corporatizing relationships than I am about my own work. I haven't done it much, but I've done it a few times. I've done consulting things. Sometimes it's kind of interesting. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but I think that uh, my answer to that is sort of that I'm a lot more careful about sort of structural relationships with, um, with, with corporate entities than I am uh, with my you know, sort of one-off type of things. Uh, in the interest of time, we will stop questions. Thank you okay, again, thank that you. was so great.